Hello, my name is Eric Kampman. I am president of Midpoint Trade Books, a national distribution company located in New York City. I'm also the owner of two publishing houses, Beaufort Books and Spencer Hill Press. And I have written um, a few books on publishing and distribution. One of them is called The Insider's Guide to Successful Publishing, which is available on Amazon. What I want to talk to you today is a little bit about trying to define and understand what a distributor can do for a publishing house. Uh, when I came into the publishing business in 1970, a long time ago, uh, the publishing industry was very East Coast. Uh, it was very focused on the established publishers. And very few independent publishers really were playing much a role in the publishing business. But during the 70s, that all changed. And uh, certain companies, including one of my own in 1981, Campman and Company, started pro providing services for these smaller independent publishers who wanted to compete in the bookstore marketplace with the largest publishers. So that really is the kind of universe that um, book publishers have been in ever since the mid-70s all the way into the uh, current period. A lot has changed in the marketplace um, and a lot has changed in publishing and I really want to kind of focus on that. So when I, the first uh, um, picture on the screen is what I call the publisher, uh, the publisher model. Uh, and really it boils down to several things that all publishers one way or the other, either in sourcing or outsourcing, have to accomplish. Uh, publishing uh, without an author, of course, is not much of a business. So I put author sort of right there at the top of the screen. And, and in the middle, I put the publisher because the publisher is like an orchestra leader. They are going to put all the uh, pieces together for the author uh, so that the book is, uh, is the sales potential for a book is optimized through the activities that take place over the course of a year or two years from the time the manuscript is brought into the publishing house until the time it hits the bookstores and starts selling uh, through the marketing and sales uh, approach of the publishing houses. So I just want to go through these uh, little boxes uh, one at a time. Uh, editorial development in the larger houses I think is probably where most things in terms of um, the book publishing activities really start. Uh, for example, the agent is dealing with the publisher and the editorial department. The editor acquires a book. The book has to be edited. That's going to take anywhere from a six months to a year, depending on the situation. And uh, it's a very elaborate process. Um, and it kind of stands on its own for a while. Uh, but at some point, uh, the information about the book is going to have to be disseminated throughout the rest of the publishing process. And that's what these other boxes are about. Uh, after editorial, I have book production. And that means pre-production. It's certainly some of the editorial process. But it's also book design, cover design, uh, type of paper you're going to have, paper hardcover. Uh, paperback or hardcover paperback simultaneous or an ebook. All of these things play in to pr the book production. And right after that, I have trade sales. And this is really where uh, I think a distributor excels or kind of falls on its face. In the larger publishing environments, uh, the traditional sales uh, department work very closely with editorial, very, work somewhat closely with book production, had a big say, uh, say in um, the positioning of a book and whether it was going to, um, a lot of books were going to be advanced or so on and so forth. I will talk more about the trade sales department and how integral it is to the distribution process as we go forward. Ebooks is a new part. It really kind of really started launching as a big factor in the first decade of the uh, uh, of this century, um, it is really kind of um, I think plateaued out a little bit. Uh, 
but just taking Amazon, for example, um, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of volume um, comes through the ebook process. It's very different than the normal um, uh, publishing process, uh, but it is somewhat dependent on uh, the editorial and the book production because really you need to get a book ready for printing uh, to have an ebook. It's a different process uh, slightly, but it really is important. Um, I mentioned here special sales channels, uh, national, uh, national international rights, uh, marketing and promotion, distribution, uh, finance and accounting. Now distribution you'll see here um, is really the physical movement of books out of a warehouse based on orders that have been received, usually EDI, which is electronically, uh, and out they go to the large accounts and the smaller accounts depending on whether the book has much of a market or, uh, or, or assumed to have much of a market or not. So uh, shipments to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, the big wholesalers like Ingram Book Company, uh, Baker & Taylor, Books A Million, and about five to 700 independent bookstores throughout the country, uh, not to mention the uh, mass merchandisers like Costco, uh, Walmart, Sam's, and so on and so forth all represent sales potentials uh, for uh, any given book that comes out. Uh, the finance and accounting uh, process is, you know, also integral uh, to the whole process of bringing a book to market because it is a commercial uh, enterprise and you, you, uh, the books are there to make money so that you can have a future. If all the books are failing, of course, the publisher eventually is going to go out of business. Um, the distribution model, the reason I have everything, uh, some of the boxes in green is really these are the key activities that a distributor, an independent distribution company like Midpoint Trade Books, like Independent Publishers Group, like uh, Perseus and Consortium, so on and so forth. The main activities they do are really distribution over on the right and trade sales on the left. Um, the reason distribution is important here is you're dealing with anywhere from 100 to 200 to 300 independent publishers all aggregated under the distributor's name. So Midpoint Trade Books, as an example, has over 200 uh, active publishers under contract with it to provide certain services so that the publisher's books can have a competitive place in the marketplace. That requires us as a company to have a strong distribution component so that the order fulfillment process, the shipping uh, and billing process all works in coordination with um, uh, works in terms of accuracy, timeliness, so on and so forth. Complicated business. The aggregation part is that when a distributor sells the Barnes & Noble, if you, as many of you may have learned, when you go in with one book, uh, you go into the small press department, they usually say, well, if you can find a distributor, we will buy 10, 15, 20, 100 copies of this book. Um, to put into the Barnes & Noble system. Uh, we take it about 400 steps further at midpoint and all the other distributors are the same in this respect. So much of what we do is based on the idea that we have many titles, not a few. That requires us to find up to um, I don't know, 100 titles, a certain of the volume level, probably over $10 million in overall uh, sales. Uh, and you have to have, in order to do that, you have to have sales management, you have to have sales reps, you have to have access to virtually every account, either through wholesalers or directly, uh, in order to um, fulfill the obligations of the contract with the uh, with the the um, publisher. So the traditional sales channels, uh, which I will go over in a second, 
are really the meat and potatoes of what we do. Um, sales has two sides to it, and I've, I've come to this conclusion kind of more or less recently. I think to be really in the, distribu in the distribution business, to really be uh, as effective as you can be, you have to work two sides of the street. On the one hand, your sales group has to be knowledgeable and experienced in the publishing business to know something about the editorial process and so not something about the production process and the marketing process so that when you're developing a book, when you're bringing it to market, when you're putting it in the catalog and the reps are and you're having a sales conference, all of this stuff, the, all the activity leading up to the sales conference really needs to be um, discussed between the publisher and uh, the leaders in the sales department, the sales manager, the director of sales, the marketing director. All these people play uh, a place in the planning process. Now, a lot of people think that the sales uh, activity is just knowing the account and putting books in there, hoping for the best, getting sales, getting reorders, so on and so forth. I think that's a very important piece, but it's not the only piece, especially for distributors. Um, in the big publishing house, the director of sales and a group of people in the marketing and sales uh, meet continuously, probably weekly, with uh, editors and publishers to make sure they've covered all their bases in bringing any book to market. All this takes time, by the way, so um, it's very rare when a book can instantly become, you know, come into the hands of a distributor and they can turn it around and make it work. So the sales department does have to have strong relationships with accounts like Barnes & Noble, just as an example. Um, they need to call on them face to face. Uh, they need to know the book well enough to uh, be able to uh, provide a reason for the buyer not to skip a book, but to actually uh, get involved and see why this will work. If it doesn't work with Barnes & Noble nationally, it, uh, it might work regionally. It might work in the top stores. It might work in certain subject matters in certain marketplaces. And the sales rep has to know that, so when they're going in, they sound knowledgeable, they sound involved, and they know the product that they're selling. Ebooks is has really very little to do with that. That's getting the book up and running. But special sales uh, is something that distributors uh, get involved with and do do to a certain extent, uh, some more than others. Uh, defining special sales is really basically uh, uh, companies that are really not in the book business, but they will sell a book because it fits into uh, whatever they're doing. Uh, you might be able to sell books to Bed, Bath, and Beyond and, and operations like that. There are plenty of stores and businesses uh, that um, can use a book to promote their business or uh, so on and so forth. Or if you might have a book on uh, uh, picture book. Uh, so photography stores may be able to sell those books. And don't forget the author themselves. Uh, they uh, may be able to uh, go into their sphere of influence and be able to felt, sell very strongly in certain markets. But all of this is a, of a piece with the activity that the distributor has to coordinate in order to be effective now, most distributors work on a two-season cycle. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that in the fall and in the spring, around now, which is in May, um, the publishers issue a catalog for the books that are coming in the next season. Uh, the next season would be anywhere from three to six to seven months ahead of time. Uh, all of the, most of the accounts buy ahead of time, so these are called advance orders. Uh, and by the time the book is ready to ship, uh, and I'm going to go into that process in a minute, um, we'll have orders in the system so that uh, we can ship those orders and when the publicity and promotion start uh, to happen, then the, the um, book will be in the stores ready to sell. 
uh, one of the uh, great problems for all smaller publishers is availability. Uh, let's say an author gets a little lucky and gets on a national morning show, uh, but they have no access to the marketplace um, and or they haven't printed enough books. This happens all the time. Uh, getting on the shows that doesn't happen all the time, but when somebody does get local or national publicity, oftentimes sales will follow because of the power of media uh, in getting a message across. And so if you're not prepared, if you haven't permit, per, um, produced enough or printed enough books, or if you have not, um, if you have not uh, done any marketing or um, so on and so forth, or don't have access to the marketplace, um, you're going to have a, a lost opportunity. Uh, and that uh, can be tragic, I mean, because uh, books are like anything else. Sales are a continuum. As long as it's available and people want it, it's going to sell. But you have to be kind of in the stream in order to have that happen. And that's really what distributors really spend so much of their time doing, of making sure a book that is, is um, getting the publicity uh, really um, has the availability, the number of books out there, the ability to ship those books, and to resupply as it happens. Now, I have an example, quite extreme, um, but I've written about it in uh, that the book I uh, mentioned earlier. Um, it came, uh, it came uh, back in 2007, an opportunity came my way that was a once in a lifetime, uh, in that the um, Goldman family, who had stopped a book called If I Did It from being published by HarperCollins, uh, the previous uh, November, HarperCollins had printed, I think, hundreds of thousands of books. And the Goldmans said, uh, uh, we are not happy that O.J. Simpson is getting paid in advance uh, against royalties for this book. Um, of course, the Goldmans' son had been killed, and they had won a civil suit against O.J. Simpson, who had never paid them a dime. As it turns out, after the book was stopped, uh, the manuscript went back to an O.J. Simpson company, which eventually the Goldman um, lawyers went after and won the rights in a court of law to publish the book themselves. And the judge said, monetize the book. And this was in, say, June of 2007. Well, I got wind of this through an agent. Uh, who told me about the book and said, would I be interested? And I was not sure whether I'd be interested. But what actually ultimately got me to decide that I should be involved in this book is it was about justice. The Goldman family now owned the rights to the book. Um, they needed a publisher who could bring the book out quickly. And uh, it had reach within the marketplace in order to fulfill the judge's command to, or, um, to monetize the book. And that's exactly what happened. I signed the contract in August of 2007. I ended up on the Today Show um, next to Denise Brown, who was not happy the book was being published because they were not part of the lawsuit. And... Um, one month later, we shipped 125,000 copies of a hardcover edition of If I Did It. And it was a, um, I mean, if we didn't have the distribution comp company, that would never have happened. Um, if uh, the O.J. Simpson had not gotten involved in some bad business in Las Vegas, I think the sales might have been either greater or less. But there was a tremendous amount of publicity around the publication of that book. Our our job at that point as a distributor was to make sure the book stayed in print, meaning that it stayed in stock for, for as long as there was demand for it. Interestingly enough, after the sales fell off, the hardcover, we did issue a paperback. And then several years later, uh, about two or three years ago, um, the uh, TV program started doing miniseries on the O.J. Simpson story, and then our book came roaring back into life, uh, which can happen in publishing all the time. So it's kind of an interesting story of, uh, of 
having an opportunity, but if I didn't, if I wasn't the head of a distribution company, uh, the story might have been quite different for the Goldmans and for uh, us too. Anyway, these things happen all the time. It's a very strange business that way. Now, what I'm going to talk about next is, well, okay, what does the sales force, what does the sales department do? Who do they reach? What kind of accounts? Um, and that really is on this, uh, I call this a sales component. And I call it channels of distribution. Um, and at the top, I have bookstore retail chains. Well, it's kind of an old-fashioned word now. Um, and, and really, there are not as many as there were because in 2011, Borders went out of business. They were a huge factor, along with Barnes and Noble, and uh, played uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of the sales of any book that was selling through these types of accounts. Uh, the history of uh, the bookstore retail chains uh, goes back to the 1970s when uh, stores opened up in uh, shopping malls. B. Dalton and Walden, they competed with one another. And they started transforming uh, the, the breadth of where books could sell. Uh, they, were, they concentrated more, uh, less on backlist and more on best-selling books, books being heavily promoted, remainders, and the like. Uh, but they really started having a huge impact on the sales reach of publishers within the American marketplace. Um, the next uh, category going to the right, library wholesalers. Most libraries, whether they're school libraries, public libraries, university libraries, business libraries, or specialized libraries of this kind or the other, prefer to, hire, uh, to uh, buy books through wholesalers. Uh, Baker and Taylor traditionally has been the most uh, well known, but Ingram Book, in terms of reaching the library market, but Ingram Book Company has a very aggressive wholesaling division that does that. Broad Art Book Company in Pennsylvania also has some programs that are very strong in the public library market, as well as some of the other uh, levels of school and university. Uh, but the reason they want this is they actually uh, don't generally see sales reps. They read book reviews. So one of the keys for any publisher, whether they're small or great, is to get advanced reviews in, in book list, publishers weekly, um, um, library journal, and others, uh, because those are what those um, magazines, the review magazines, um, are what many of the buyers in the uh, library systems used to um, stock books. They're looking for bestsellers, looking for category books, they're looking for this, that, and the other thing. And as long as they have a budget, they're, you're, they're buying. But they're buying through the wholesalers because like a distributor for trade books, wholesalers aggregate. In other words, they can order from 20 different publishers at the same time, saving a tremendous amount of labor and cost. Uh, in bringing a book into the public library. If they were buying just from an independent publisher, sometimes they do. Um, the, then they have all of these people they owe bills to, uh, customer service problems, and so on and so forth. So they really do prefer utilizing these large distribution, uh, I'm sorry, wholesale operations. National wholesalers I generally define as uh, people that uh, not only deal with the public library market, but deal with the book trade. Uh, probably the most uh, famous now is Ingram Book Company, uh, which came on the scene in 1970, um, fell into the trade uh, wholesaling business um, by happenstance to a certain extent. It wasn't the original business plan. Um, and they started providing avail uh, access and availability to titles on a real-time basis. Uh, whether the, the bookstore was in California, whether it was in Texas or Minnesota, wherever it was, if a book took off, the wholesaler could get, uh, such as Ingram, also Baker and & Taylor and Bookazine and others, could get that 
book in a timely fashion to the store to satisfy the demand. Um, it's as simple as that. It's called a demand wholesaler. And it's very important in the process because publishers traditionally were on the East Coast and it would take forever to get books out to California just because that really was not their main, uh, their objective was to sell books, but their main thing was editorial, acquiring books, and they didn't think about this. And they were actually too small as indep independent publishers to uh, make a you know make any sense of um, of putting lots of money into distribution, but wholesaling was just about that. They would have the books in stock, they would aggregate the orders coming in from this account and that account, and it made a tremendous difference in the availability of books throughout the whole country, and later throughout the entire world. Uh, independent bookstores have been going through a renaissance over the last ten years at least. Um, there was a huge fallout <coughs> when, uh, uh, excuse me, when <coughs> when uh, Barnes and Noble was growing and when uh, Borders was growing, uh, the independents suffered tremendously during that period, and so uh, some of them went out of business. Uh, the uh, independent store market got smaller, but more recently, in the last ten, maybe even longer than that, years. Um, the independent stores have made a great comeback. You know, the reason they are doing well across the board, and that might be as many as seven or eight hundred stores in the country, is because they have a personal relationship to the people that come into the stores. They create an environment. It's all about culture. It's all about uh, coffee and, and sitting around and having conversations about books or about it's just an environment. And a lot of these stores have been very successful in creating these environments. And people will just like to go to them and hang out and have a good time. And a lot of books are sold that way. Um, it's, a, it's not as big a factor as it used to be in the book business prior to the 1970s. Uh, but it is very important for some kind of publishers, particularly more literary types. But uh, they do bestsellers. They do everything. And so they become more of a factor um, to the surprise of many, given the existence of Amazon. Um, um, they're doing well. And uh, I think there's no reason to believe they won't continue to do well. The internet retailers, um, I'll just kind of reduce that to the word Amazon. There are many others as well. But Amazon came on board around 1995 or 1996. Uh, and the world's never been the same since then. And Amazon not only is in the book business, but they're in myriad number of businesses. And I must say that um, just from the book business point of view, they've gotten more and more important. Um, what they do is they're they're totally customer centric. They're they're all they're interested in making sure the customer experience is is a good one and is competitive with the kind of experience you would have if you're going into search for a books in a bookstore. Uh, they're, they, you, they, they're very interested in getting as much data on a book. They do a tremendous amount of cross uh, marketing. Uh, if you look for a certain kind of uh, uh, you author work of fiction, you're going to get six or seven other books um, right under the main uh, bibliographic information. But other books you might be interested in, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, they have actually taken the revolution in technology uh, in the 80s, and they have totally monetized it. And publishers uh, had some, have sometimes had a hard time dealing with this change, because it has changed the way books are sold. But uh, it's generally been a net good. Um, you know, the uh, we do a, a very large percentage of business with Amazon. Uh, I think from a distributor point of view and a sales point of view, a sales department point of view, it's up to us to figure out how to deal with the complications of dealing with Amazon. It's not simple. Uh, we have a whole host of people in our company, and I know other companies just like us do the same thing, where it dealing with Amazon, um, does take more than one person. Um, 
there's all kinds of activities, advertising activities, and other things that Amazon offers and or insists on uh, that uh, are very important. So uh, Amazon has become crucial to every publisher in the business, and, um, and, uh, and it's a very important for a publisher that's a one-book publisher as well as one of the you know one of the bigger publishers like Harper Collins. Uh, so that kind of mass merch and wholesale clubs, uh, we have a series called Summer Fit um, that, came, that sort of um, indirectly grew out of another series that was called Summer Bridge, books that are designed to help kids during the summertime prepare for the next grade level. Uh, and we have had, uh, with the Summer Fit series, a great deal of success in the cost, Costco marketplace. Uh, where it's tens of thousands of books are sold during the, uh, the months uh, that these books really uh, have uh, the highest consumer interest, which is kind of interesting because you, you, these books essentially come out new every year in March and April, and they sell into the early part of July, and then they really almost, one, one night <laughs> almost, uh, they stop selling in July. It's a it, year after year. We've been working with both those series, Summer Bridge uh, back when, and then more recently, Summer Fit. And uh, it's the same. You, they have a certain period of, of sale ability at which point it ends. And then you start preparing for the next season. Again, a sales department that is experienced would know how to do this. Uh, know how to um, negotiate and, and discuss uh, sales potential with a Costco. Um, know where to place books so you don't have too many uh, get returns at the end of July, so on and so forth. So uh, it's a great example of what can be done with some of these mass, mass merch accounts are really not in the book business, but they do submit, uh, sell a tremendous number of books um, over the course of a year. Wholesale clubs are virtually the same. That would be Sam's and people like that. Um, the key to understanding those accounts is that they only have so much room for books. And so when they put your book in, they're probably taking another out. Um, and so uh, you have to be very aware that um, if they don't sell books in a certain amount of time with a certain velocity, uh, producing a certain number of dollars, uh, they're going to replace your book with something else that does have the potential or they think does have the potential of selling at a higher volume. So it's a pretty lethal business, especially if your book has been slow to take off. Returns can run in the 50% range, and in addition to advertising and marketing costs, it can be very difficult to make money doing that. But if you have the right book, it is a tremendous um, uh, vehicle or channel to sell through. So that's sort of a, a kind of an overview of what sales um, departments do for you within the context of a larger distribution operation. So let me try to kind of summarize this. Um, a good sales department. Um, knows the books well enough and has a close enough relationship to the publisher so they can enter into a creative conversation about what the potential of the book is. Uh, number two, they can give very specific advice um, as to whether it should be a paperback, whether you should do an e-book simultaneous with the launch of the new book. Uh, um, they can look at uh, book jackets and give an opinion as to uh, one that might work better in the marketplace. Uh, there are a tremendous resource of information back to the publisher about their the publisher's own books uh, that can be invaluable. I have sat in innumerable meetings where a conversation gets started and at the end of the conversation, several months later, you have a national bestseller. But you never know where the great ideas are going to come from. It's not just from one person. Uh, but you have to have the opportunity to have conversation. You have to have the opportunity to listen and communicate. At the same time, 
uh, a great sales department has very strong personal relations with the buyers in the accounts you're selling to, whether it's the independent store, whether it's the Barnes & Noble, the Books A Million, you name it. That is very crucial. And they have to have a reputation of being honest uh, and doing their uh, using their best judgment in terms of placement of quantities. Not every book should be on a front table promotion at Barnes & Noble, uh, but some books that aren't there should have been there. Um, uh, salespeople have to be um, aware and uh, uh, aware and, and cognizant of uh, seasonal opportunities like Easter, Christmas, Halloween, all of those things. Um, uh, uh, what is the uh, the 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 the, um, the new you promotions the health uh, or uh, at our IRS time in April uh, money but the the sales of those come in February March when people are actually starting to work on their taxes so all of these things are uh, what experienced people know about and can communicate back to the publisher who uh, does need to get that information so the Bottom line here for me in terms of distribution, as I define it, uh, really is an outsource for a publisher who is in the business of producing and publishing books, of finding the right author, of packaging the books correctly, uh, whatever that means, but packing appropriately I think is a better word. Of, of, of bringing the book out at the right time, of providing enough time from the time the book is listed to be published to the time when it's actually going to be published. There are a whole um, series of timing uh, issues. For example, a lot of people mix up the word, um, the pub date, the publishing date, with the um, the bound book date, which is when it comes off press, or the shipping date, when it uh, leaves the uh, binder's warehouse, goes to the distributor's warehouse, and then goes to the bookstore market. All of those things take time, and if, if you confuse those dates and you say, well, the pub date is when it came off press, no. You're going to not have any books in the bookstores. You need that six to eight weeks from the time it comes off press and then you have need months uh, in order to um, prepare a book for the marketplace. For example, if you want any chance of getting a publisher's weekly review, you need to get a bound galley to publishers weekly or something, some version of the book to publishers weekly uh, about four months prior to your publication date, not your shipping date, your publication date. And what is publication date? Well, that is the time when you start to make public the book itself, you make the public aware the book exists. It's not just the fact that it's in the store, but the author is on the Today Show, uh, or the author is on CNN or Fox if it's, it's a nonfiction political book, for example. All of these things have to more or less work in tandem. What makes it difficult for us is we have literally hundreds of titles that come out every year. So you can imagine the potential for chaos in a poorly run distribution company is almost 100%. But if you're well run and you, um, you, you know what you're doing, then your distributor is a vehicle into the marketplace that provides you with the ability to compete with the largest publishers. You may not have the same sales level. You may not have an author who's as well known as uh, James Patterson, uh, but you have the, the chance of making that book into a much better seller than it otherwise would be using the professionalism of a, an established distribution company that is there to serve not only the marketplace, but to serve publishers and to serve authors um, no different than an editorial uh, publisher situation in a large house uh, would do exactly the same thing. Thank you very much.